Happy Friday, folks, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Knockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting June 8th, 2015. As always, let's jump right in with this week's daily security bites. Monday's story is a new variant of point of sale or POS malware called Malum POS. This comes from research from one of WatchGuard's partners, Trend Micro, who found a new variant of malware called Malware POS. Point of sale malware is a type of malware that infects your system and then monitors processes for credit card track data, the specific data that's on the magnetic stripe of a credit card. According to Trend Micro, Malum POS targets Oracle Micros environments, a very specific point of sale system. Apparently, there's over 300,000 different installations of this system across the United States, and it's very common with hospitality, food, and retail type organizations. In any case, this is very much like a whole bunch of other POS malware out there, as once it infects your system, it's going to start to steal credit card track data. Some of the more unique and interesting aspects of this malware is it seems to hide as a graphics driver, specifically a NVIDIA graphics driver on your system. It also seems to be able to be configured to target other point of sale systems besides just the Oracle system. In any case, if you're a hospitality organization, a, a restaurant, or a retailer in the U.S., you definitely need to be concerned with this type of malware. Definitely have some sort of antivirus running, like WatchGuard's Gateway Antivirus. But more importantly, this type of malware is designed to evade many different signature-based AV systems by repacking itself regularly. So you might want to use products like WatchGuard's APT Blocker, which are sandbox environments that can catch advanced malware without needing a signature beforehand. Tuesday's story is the government mandating the use of HTTPS for federal websites. Today, the White House issued an order saying that federal websites have to use HTTPS or secure websites for all federal websites out there. And if you've watched my videos over the past few years, you've probably noticed me commenting on the increased use of HTTPS. This is due to something I call the Snowden effect. Whether you love or hate Snowden, one thing is sure. Snowden did show the world that nation states and other entities can intercept and snoop on our web traffic. And as a result, many different different big websites out there have started defaulting to HTTPS, places like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Twitter, and so on. In fact, recently, Netflix even said it's going to start using HTTPS for its video streams, which is a pretty big deal since Netflix accounts for 34% of all U.S.'s internet traffic. In any case, forcing HTTPS is probably a good thing. As a security person, we want our communications to be encrypted. More importantly, it will help us avoid illegitimate websites. HTTPS also allows us to authenticate that the site we're going to really is the site we think it is. So overall, this is a good thing. However, there is one little hidden issue here, and that's the fact that bad guys use HTTPS. And with us adopting HTTPS, our network gear not only has to keep keep up with HTTPS, but we need security gear that can actually decrypt and inspect HTTPS, if at least just for a moment, to ensure that we can scan it for malware and other sorts of attacks that might happen over this secure web channel. So anyways, the federal government is mandating the use of HTTPS for all its websites. Ultimately, I think you're going to find that most of the internet will use HTTPS as the years go on. However, as you're choosing security gear, be sure to have things like WatchGuard's XTM devices that can actually decrypt and inspect HTTPS to make sure that bad guys can't sneak any sort of attack through this back door. One last aside, my story today should be Microsoft Patch Day, but since I'm on the East Coast, it's about three hours till Patch Day goes live, and I'm going to be on the show floor for the rest of the day. But if you're a Microsoft administrator, be sure to check Microsoft's site, because patches are coming soon. According to our IPS updates, there's definitely going to be some Office updates and Internet Explorer updates, so go get them when you can. Wednesday's story is Microsoft and Adobe Patch Day. If you watched yesterday's video, you noticed that yesterday was Patch Day, but I did my 
my video before they posted their updates. Well, today I want to cover those updates. Yesterday, Microsoft posted eight security bulletins. Two of them were critical. These bulletins fixed 45 vulnerabilities in many of their software products. The biggest ones are a critical cumulative Internet Explorer patch, which fixes over 24 vulnerabilities, many of which people can use in drive-by downloads to exploit code on your users' computers if they visit the wrong site. The other critical one was a Windows Media Player vulnerability. Basically, if a bad guy can get one of your users to view a malicious media file, they can gain control of your computer. On top of that, there is a number of other Windows-related elevation of privilege vulnerabilities, some Office document handling vulnerabilities, and also an Exchange Server cross-site request forgery vulnerability. If an attacker can get one of your users to click a specially crafted link, they may be able to access that user's email and other stuff. Long story short, if you're a Microsoft administrator, you better go and get those updates as soon as possible. Definitely do the critical ones first. By the way, if you're a WatchGuard XTM or Firebox user, our IPS does have signatures for many of the Internet Explorer and Office document vulnerabilities. So be sure to update your IPS over the next few days. Besides that, Adobe also released a big Flash update. If I remember correctly, it fixes 14 vulnerabilities in Flash, again, many of which allow remote code execution. So just like the Internet Explorer vulnerabilities, if a bad guy can entice your user to a malicious site that has maliciously crafted Flash, uh, they can gain control of your user's computer. So you might want to update Flash as well. Hopefully you have Adobe set to auto-update your clients. Thursday's story is a fascinating new advanced persistent threat called Dooku2. Today, Kaspersky disclosed to the world that their network had been breached. This spring, they found an advanced piece of malware, which they called Dooku2, on their network. By the way, you might remember Dooku. This was a 2011 nation-state attack that some called the son of Stuxnet, since it had some similarities. In any case, Kaspersky said Dooku2 was a very, very advanced piece of malware. Some of its unique properties was it was an entirely memory-based trojan. It never put a file on the victim's system. It also used a number of different zero-day vulnerabilities in its malware. Uh, two of the zero days have been patched, but one of the zero day uh, was a Windows elevation of privilege flaw, basically something that could allow you to become a domain administrator on the network. And apparently this malware, when it infects a system, it would use this flaw to become a domain administrator and spread itself to other computers on the network using an MSI installer file, which is how administrators often install stuff using group policy. In any case, this was a very, very advanced piece of malware that took Kaspersky admittedly a long time to find. And by the way, Kaspersky says they're not the only victim of this particular attack campaign. It was also used during the uh, P5 plus 1 events. This was, of course, when a lot of Western uh, countries uh, tried to negotiate with Iran to make sure that they didn't get nuclear weapons. So what's the takeaway for this network? attack. Well, first of all, I really respect Kaspersky, who's one of WatchGuard's security partners, for transparently disclosing the fact that their network was breached. Frankly, I don't think there's any dishonor in being breached. Nowadays, it's not whether or not you're going to be breached, but whether or not you will be able to find out when you've been breached. I think a good measure of a security company isn't that they have perfect security, but is that they react quickly when they do have incidents and take care of them. And for this, I think Kaspersky's done very, very well. I also think this attack should have us questioning our nation states' activities. Really, nation states should do more to protect their citizens and defend their networks from attack. This idea of launching these attack campaigns against private businesses, especially security companies that can help solve the problem, is a little disingenuous and kind of scary to me. I hope they stop this. Finally, Kaspersky offered some interesting takeaways for how they're going to continue to defend against this. They plan on using their sandbox system. And by the way, one of the ways you can catch the more advanced malware out there is with systems like WatchGuard's APT blocker. Systems that don't just rely on signatures to find malware, but rather use behaviors to detect malware that may never have been seen before. Another really interesting tip Kaspersky puts in one of their papers is to use 64-bit versions of Windows. You know, a lot of you probably are using 
64-bit versions today, but it actually makes it a little harder for malware to do things since drivers have to be signed in 64-bit versions of Windows. In any case, this is really a fascinating story. There's a lot of deep technical details, so if you want to know more about it, be sure to check the blog post associated with this video as I have a lot of links that reference uh, all kinds of papers on this. On Friday, I'm talking about an update to the OPM or Office of Personnel Management breach story. You probably remember in last week's weekly video, I talked about the big breach to OPM where bad guys made off with over 4 million records for federal civilian employees. This week, there's new news showing that the breach is probably bigger than suspected. Basically, the president of the union that represents federal workers wrote a letter mentioning how bad the breach was. Now, apparently, they believe anywhere from 9 to 14 million uh, employee records that date back all the way to the 1980s may have been stolen. More importantly, I mentioned that the bad guys did make off with social security numbers, and it turns out these were unencrypted social security numbers, which is just a horrible security practice, storing such sensitive data in an unencrypted fashion. So these bad guys really do have all the personally identifiable information on all of these employees, which is really bad news. Also, there's a motherboard story where a criminal seeming hacker has claimed responsibility for the OPM breach. He goes by the silly alias Ebola Bad, and on the underground he posted 23,000 email addresses for .mail and .government employees. And while some of these emails do look legitimate, there really is nothing that ties it to the OPM breach. You know, there's a good chance this uh, attacker is just social engineering and using this breach to claim a little bit of cred. In either case, the fact that uh, the government is attributing this to China really hasn't been validated yet. Finally, the practical takeaways. Obviously, if you're a federal employee or anyone really that has had your personal information stolen from an online account, you definitely do want to monitor your credit, and the U.S. government is offering free uh, credit monitoring for 18 months. However, this is really insufficient protection. This will tell you when somebody's opening accounts under your name. But one of the big takeaways here is whenever someone steals all this information, especially your social security number, your email addresses, your address, all kinds of personal information about you, it's a great opportunity for these bad actors to actually hijack many of your online accounts. If you think about the forgot my password mechanisms or the, the phone mechanisms where you can call up a company and validate yourself to say your bank online by using your social security number, now these bad guys can do the same. They can use this information to hijack many different accounts. So really, if someone steals your personal information, it's a good idea to monitor all your online accounts. You may even want to call up very important accounts like your bank and tell them to lock the account, not to allow people to do anything over the phone or online, but only in person in the bank. In any case, it's a very interesting attack and we'll continue to keep our eyes on it. That's it this week. I hope you found it interesting. But if you're hungry for more security stories, please follow our blog at blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. Besides posting videos and articles, you'll always find this weekly post there as well, which has a reference section with links to many other security stories that came out this week. You can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Finally, if you want these videos right away, follow the YouTube channel, because sometimes I post them but can't blog about it until later. Anyways, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.